So hello and welcome to the second High Tech Connect event in 2023. Our topic today is why 85% of AI projects don't make it into production and how we can uh, possibly improve that. We have three AI experts today addressing this question. One is an AI engineering startup, Marcus Avalon. Uh, one is uh, from a big tech firm in Silicon Valley, Joyce Weiner, and then from a large chemical company at the digital department, Yves Stommel as well. Let's start with uh, Marco from Artificially. Hello, Marco. Thanks for hey. being here. Thank you, Ralph. Sure. Um, so how is life post-COVID, post-supply chain problems, maybe soon post-inflation and still war in Europe uh, for a startup these days? Well, you know, uh, we, <laughs> we just opened the startup just at the beginning of COVID in 2020. I think that the, the, week, up, the week after there was a lockdown here in Switzerland. So <laughs> it was a tough time. But eventually, you know, it's uh, three years afterwards and we have 20 people working now at the company. So things are going pretty well, I would say. And mm -hmm. the AI, AI is, is going well and machine learning. So, so I would say it's, it's going fine. Okay, great. Uh, nice to hear. And we have Joyce from Intel in the US. Hello, Joyce. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thanks. I uh, hope you're too well. Um, th uh, thanks for taking some time and joining for us. So how is Intel handling the layoff? I call it lemming movement in big tech firms these days. Is Intel also uh, joining the others um, and let, let people go? Yes, although um, we're tempering it with uh, keeping enough of uh, the team together to be able to execute. And so part of our strategy is, is execution and being able to deliver good products. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what's happening right now. Okay, good. Good to hear. And then we have Eve uh, from Evonik Digital. Hello, Eve. Welcome. And also thanks to you for, for taking your time. Thanks, Eve. Sure. Um, so how is it for a chemical company uh, these days coping with all these uncertainties and I suppose still quite high energy costs? Uh, yes, so uncertainty, there's enough of that, that's for sure. So supply chain is, of course, a continued issue for us. Um, we're a very diversified company, especially chemicals. So um, things tend to even each other out. So that's good. But um, specifically, our supply chain colleagues certainly are not bored. That's for sure. OK, good. All right, so let's share my screen. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So the topic I already mentioned uh, discuss why 85% of uh, AI projects uh, don't make it into production today. Um, and uh, this is actually coming uh, from this uh, firm here that everyone knows uh, in 2019 in January, they were writing about that in their um, uh, top data and, and uh, analytics uh, predictions. Um, so maybe just read it quick. Uh, through 2022, only 15% um of use cases leveraging ai techniques such, such as machine learning and deep neural networks and involving edge and iot environments will be successful so it's 15 are, are successful that means 85 percent are not and then of course many others picked it up uh, just have a couple of examples here um they took the same number 85 percent and uh, they claim to know their reasons uh, leadership troubles pure, pure communication hopeful outlook lack of skills, and then also maybe to ambitious intentions. Uh, then the numbers went suddenly up by venture beat. I don't know how the 2% came from, but uh, they picked it up as well, more or less. And uh, then these guys here um, used it uh, to say why 98% uh, maybe um, they should expect to um, to fail um, because of insufficient data, pure engineering, and then also complex areas for, in general, for many AI applications. and. Today, we have also a choice, uh, Weiner here from Intel. Uh, she wrote uh, this little book um, and looked more at the project reasons. Um, and uh, the five that she brought up was the scope of the project too big, the project scope increased in size as the project progress, so um, scope creep, and uh, the model couldn't be explained, um, I guess, which uh, concerned uh, decision makers. Uh, the model was too complex, um, probably related to the, the one before. And then also she was saying that the project solved the wrong problem, which of course is not going to help at all. Um, so that's uh, just my quick intro. Uh, Marco, not ladies first, but uh, startups first these days. Uh, so what's your very quick uh, reaction on these uh, couple of slides? Uh, okay, we are, I would say we are a special type of startup. 
startup in the sense that both uh, I and my co-founder have been doing a research in AI for you know 20 to 30 years already in the research institute. So and we have had a lot of contact with the companies before that as we have experience. So it's not really like a startup made by young people. Uh, and my I agree that uh, there is a tendency to pay for AI projects, but I think that uh, this is mostly due to human factors not two technological factors this is my this is my experience i don't want to you know mm -hmm. give a uh, counter views with respect for instance to, for, to joyce that for sure will have uh very strong reasons about the air claims but uh, my experience is that if there is the right team on place then it's difficult not to make the project succeed because at this time the technology is there mm -hmm. uh, what we what we need is a proper team a proper team of you know, people that believe in the project and uh, work on it Right. So, Joyce, uh, hand over to you. What's your very quick, uh, later on, we dive into more details, uh, reaction on that. You wrote a book, so I guess you principally agree. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with Marco. Um, most of the, the challenges I've seen in, in deploying a project and getting getting something all the way to the finish line where it's actually in production have been uh, people problems mm -hmm. uh, the human effects of it. Uh, you know, the team gets all excited about deep neural nets, builds this model, and then management to have an explanation of why it's choosing things this versus that thing. Why is the model deciding that way? I can't explain it. Then they say, sorry, yeah, nice model, but we're not going to actually give that in front of our customers or put that in our manufacturing line. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's usually factor related, not necessarily technology. And that's the thing nowadays is that the compute really is caught up. Mm -hmm. If you want to do something, uh, as long as you have data, that's the other part, um, you can do it. Okay. And uh, finally, Eve, what's your quick uh, reaction on this? Um, I suppose we're going to talk about the numbers later, but in general, I think, right. it, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's a people issue, both on the people that actually built these things. So more like a front end loading issue, mm -hmm. if I can take that terminology from, from engineering. So really make sure you have everything clear before you actually start, but then also the technology acceptance on the user side. But the other thing is that I think we have to realize that this is still a fairly young technology in terms of being industrially ready. Um, mm -hmm. So we're all still learning. So I think it's not a surprise that we're all still finding our ways, um, not just from a people point of view, but also from a technology point of view. Okay, so let's go into the numbers, uh, as Eve said, uh, Marco. Um, so, and uh, you must be honest, <laughs> just among <laughs> us here. Right. So, uh, what's what's your own percentage? What, uh, how how many did you guys uh, deliver, and uh, how many, uh, uh, yeah, which just uh, for whatever reason uh, not uh, make the finish line or, or went into into production? I guess that's that's the question here, right? Okay, well, that we finish, I think it's uh, nearly 100%. And then that they go of production, I think that we are probably close to something like 60 something percent. Okay. Um, yeah. Cook. They are going in production. So that 40% yes. would be your number then. Uh, okay. Yeah. I see. Right. And uh, Joyce, how is it that uh, at Intel, the projects you're working with? Uh I speak for all of Intel because it's a huge company, but I can talk to my <laughs> stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would say um, it's not uh, 85%, you know, if, I guess it's on how you count, right? If you try, mm -hmm. if you count from every model that I've tried for particular data sets, it might be 85% um, because you try a bunch of stuff early on when you're mm -hmm. exploring the data and trying to understand what type of model will work best. Um, but then, um, yeah, it, Again, I think I learned a lot over the years and in in learning models and part of it is really doing a lot of work up front. So um, your first reactions, well, hey, I have this cool data set, I'm gonna model it and I'm going to do all this stuff. Uh, it's better to, to take time and go slowly at the beginning of the project and really understand what it is that the user is going to need and want. Um, and then you have a much higher chance of success. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so did I understand this uh, correctly? Uh, five percent are making it from what you, what you start looking at. Uh, so, ninety-five percent not. Uh, oh, I don't think I threw a number out there. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I thought I heard the five. Okay. 
um, if how it's how it's with uh, Evonik Digital. So okay, so maybe first of all, Evonik Digital is just a function. Um, Evonik overall um, is the kind of the company I'm looking at. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm with Joyce that the starting point is difficult, right? I mean, how many, there's there's tons of ideas. Many don't really see the light of day. They're just somewhere and they might not be continued. But from the start that there's actually a real discussion about is this possible? Do we want to implement it and so forth? I'd say currently about one in three is either discontinued right there or discontinued later. Mm -hmm. And of the other ones, of the other 60, 70%, we have about, I would say, 20% that we call operationalized. So they're scaled, they have a service level and so forth. The other 80% currently, but it's changing, the other 80% currently are what we would call MVPs. And honestly, mm -hmm. in many cases, that's fine, right? They don't have to be okay. online 24 seven. If they fail for a few hours, that's okay too, right? They do their job, but they're not as managed as a real IT product. But again, mm -hmm. for many, that's okay. Okay, yeah, thanks. So let's uh, dive into the money uh, because ultimately this is done uh, to have some some return on investment, right? Not just to have fun, I, I suppose. Um, any anything you can share here, Marco? Projects that you guys have done and uh, what type of uh, return on investment, Roy, um, are, are is being applied? Um, I mean, any any anything you can share here? And uh, yeah, um, I think it's difficult for me to talk about Roy or these companies because. You know, we are a relatively young startup. And so, you know, I think that they start seeing results now. So it's difficult for me to evaluate. What I would say is that, uh, you know, we are really doing AI. We are not an IT company in a traditional sense. We do AI and machine learning. And and uh, and I said, we grew from zero to 20 people. We are all maintained on projects. So all our projects are well, very well on tracks. And uh, our feeling is that the companies are satisfied. And especially, you know, in a number of cases, we see that they are quite shy at the beginning, and then eventually they come back and they want to widen up uh, the type of project, uh, how, how deep we go into their business and so So I think we provide value. I would also distinguish, if I have just a minute of time, you know, two different types of AI, I think we should distinguish. One is the very big AI, like, you know, Microsoft OpenAI, DeepMind, and so on and so forth which are very big companies that have super ambitious projects, but uh, usually don't, you know, don't get their money back in the sense that they're in the red okay. numbers from, from beginning to end, right? Maybe now and they then, get it back, so who knows? Yeah, now, now, now with OpenAI, it's much better. But, you know, and then there are the companies like uh, mine or other companies that are more on practical, practical use cases, not super huge ambitious projects. And this kind of thing here is difficult because there are not so many companies that can live with AI. So mm -hmm. it's, it, but it is still possible because uh, you're not promising the moon, right? You're not giving an AI that does everything, but just solves a specific task with reliability, explainability, and so on and so forth. All these things that, for instance, neural networks in general don't do. So we also use neural networks, but they have to be framed in a certain context to make them reliable and this and that. So my point is, if we relate good algorithms with good people in a good team, then things get done and you really automatize a number of things and, and the client is satisfied and get and see an advantage with respect to their ROI. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thanks. Uh, so Joyce, uh, can you share some ROI numbers, uh, you know, um, that uh, the reason why I'm a uh, little pushing on, on concrete numbers is that uh, there are these management consultancies out there, don't name them, but you all know them. They have these huge, uh, you know, huge, huge uh, numbers of savings that I, I can bring. So if there's huge amount of savings, I'm, I'm looking for concrete, uh, some concrete examples and numbers, right, what has been done. So that's, uh, that's where I guess we're about is also asking, we're asking you now. Yeah, you know, in my case, a lot of our projects have been monetized because they often are along the lines of support for engineers. Um, so if I reduce uh, the amount of work an engineer has, I can I can do some math, right? And I can figure, okay, if I save, you know, 20 hours uh, of engineering time per project, and there's so many of these types of projects here, I can do this math, and mm -hmm. then but um, engineers, what ends up happening is they, uh, if you free up time, they go work on something else. <laughs> so that's really kind of a, a small uh, then 
uh, estimate. It's on the on the small side. If I just say I freed up, you know, two hours of engineering time a week. Um, the challenge, what do they do with that two hours of engineering time? Usually something more valuable to the company. Um, mm -hmm. And monetizing that is, has been a continual challenge for me. If, and if anybody has ideas, I would love to hear it. Right. Okay. So maybe Eve can share some concrete numbers or how is Evonik uh, looking at this? Uh, are you looking at Roy or is this more like, um, yeah, well, you're trying to apply some new technology and see over over time and what's uh, what's coming out of it. Uh, how is how is how you're looking at that? Um, yeah, it's a mixture. It's we often work with payback times, um, depending also on the economic climate that we have. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, we also work with with actual dollar or euro amounts. Um, maybe to to frame that a little bit or to kind of borrow from what Marco said. So um, the framing for us is if we look at AI or ML or making use of data, advanced data analytics, we typically look at three different kind of, I would say, groupings. So the first one would be products where we actually add AI functionality to a product. That's not something that's very easily doable for a chemical company. We have it um, in business models where we try to enable business models with AI. That's a very complex thing and it takes time. So also there, I will not be able to give you many examples. Most of what we do is in the third category, which is what we call processes. So we try to utilize AI ML to enable our processes. This can be finding the next molecule, the next formulation, can be optimizing production, can be optimizing pricing, finding the right point in time when to buy materials and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in this area, we do have um, most projects, about I would say 85%. And of those, we have payback times from really two weeks, right, up to maybe never, right? So that's a very wide range. And okay. the, the actual savings can be, again, just from a few thousand, if you're looking at saving time, as, uh, as Joyce just mentioned, but we also have uh, projects that we really saved in the millions. Um, because in many cases for these processes, you have big multipliers, right? If you're able to increase your yields by 0.1%, mm -hmm. if you're able to you know, buy at the right time a certain raw material and you buy millions of that raw material, just a few cents can make a big difference, mm -hmm. right? So here, this this, uh, this certainly can have a big impact, but it also fluctuates, right? There are then time frames and there's a lot of benefit from the same project and the same application and the next year there might not be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Marco, you were nodding a lot, so I'm going to add something to that. Or... Yeah, yeah, in particular because uh, we are recently working with a very big uh, chemical company that uh, I don't know how much it relates to yours, uh, even, but in this case, they build very big plants, you know, industrial plants, uh, chemical plants. And, uh, and uh, I observed something very similar to what Yves was saying. So, there you can save a lot of money because you anticipate the material that you have to buy. Uh, with AI, so if you, you know, you can plan your plant much quicker than you could be, you could do before and much more precise. So, you know, mm -hmm. in advance, the material to buy much better. So the offer that you can do to your client of this, of this chemical company is more precise, uh, quicker and so. And on the other hand, for instance, these companies, at least this is my experience, um, you know, outsource a lot of work to like, uh, you know, engineers in India you know, to do all manual work uh, that costs much less, but still, uh, you know, it requires a lot of time because maybe for, um, you know, design is a plant uh, in a proper way, it takes one month. Mm -hmm. And uh, with AI, very often you can skip a lot of these processes. You can automatize them. You have the result in a couple of hours. You save the money, you know, you don't have source. So it's really very practical advantages. With this company in particular, we had done a prototype at the beginning and they were quite uh, lukewarm, you know, about AI. And then after the results of this prototype, it can, can have been luck, you know, but they, they become super ex excited, all the CDA, and now they want to put AI everywhere to automatize mm -hmm. the processes. Okay. So, uh, Joyce, you want to add something? Is it pr primarily a process improvement or does it go into products uh, mainly or you have all over the place where you are you're looking for um, uh, advantages and some yeah, return on the, the time invested? efforts definitely all over the place so um okay. i particularly focus on using ai in to the company rather than using ai to add to our products but there are huge teams also doing that work mm -hmm. um, and you know for example one of the the projects we delivered is uh, a tool for our um, chip designers so that they can uh, look at thermal modeling real time and then have mm -hmm. the AI assist with 
uh, with placements um, of very different compute used in the chip and uh, mm -hmm. optimize the thermals across the chip. So, you know, there's like that that we are doing um, that, uh, you know, again, is, is you know, freeing up engineering time. So I'm not having to do this manipulation mm -hmm. and iterate myself. I just ask AI to like, give me, you know, give me the top five choices. And I know myself as a, as a designer that this one is than these other two, um, mm -hmm. you know, choose accordingly. Um, the neat thing for us there is that we're doing a little bit of reinforcement learning as well. So then those decisions go back into the data set, um, which makes that quite interesting. Okay. Uh, that's the the type of uh, you know cases uh, I'm I'm particularly interested in on the things that I've been working on. Mm -hmm. Eva, does the, the high energy cost play a role for you guys now that you're looking more into the optimizing process to save energy or, well, is a business as before you're looking at uh, yeah, practically uh, any possibilities? No, so energy certainly is always an issue. Um, our processes have been pretty much optimized for energy use already in the past. So okay. um, there's not too much you can squeeze out if you just keep running the same process. What you can do is you can, of course, use different plants. We, are, mm -hmm. we have a worldwide setup, so you can always shift production to a certain extent. Um, and what you can do in a production plant, and that's actually where we do have um, what we call operator assistance tools in some mm -hmm. places in place that um, are able to do a trade-off. For example, typically, of course, in a chemical reaction, you can choose to have the highest yield, but that will typically cut down on your throughput and it will typically increase your energy costs. Right? Think about a column, for mm -hmm. example. Um, but you can, of course, then also say, OK, in this case, energy is very expensive. So the optimal price point for us in production is to accept a lower yield, right? but also meaning we need less energy to do that. Right. Um, and that goes back to what Marco before said, to find that optimal set point. Um, on a dynamic, ongoing basis, like on a mm -hmm. daily basis. That's something where certainly I can directly help, and right. it does help. Okay, good, thanks. Um, let, let's talk a couple of minutes about machine learning ops. So that's basically, um, for the folks who don't know it here, um, is uh, all the tools that have been developed over the you know, 10 plus years or so, um, where you get uh, up and running very quickly, right? Uh, I don't mention any of them, and the tons of books out there, more and more every day coming out, and best practices and whatnot. Um, so has this overall improved um, also your own work um, or it's pretty much uh, you know the same, you're just doing more ambitious things maybe, but uh, bottom line is the same or are you faster, more more productive and ultimately also um, you know get things out, uh, get more things out into, into production or how is that uh, working for you, Marco? Uh, uh, okay, so, so if the question is uh, about the availability of libraries for AI, of course, that has changed everything. Yeah, 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 sure. The amount, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, amount, uh, the amount quality of Python libraries and also the availability of using that free of uh, license in a sense that you can embed them in commercial packages has mm -hmm. changed completely the, the panorama now of uh, possible applications in AI. Then, uh, so that is really fundamental for us. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, uh, okay, if you mean is that the good practices of programming using these libraries like MLOps in the sense of good practices, also mm -hmm. that is very important, of course, but uh, I guess it's more important for a bigger company because when you are like, I don't know, 10 data scientists and so you don't need so much of an organization, if you have a hundred and you want to work all together with the same libraries and so, then of course uh, you, you have to take into account MLOps seriously. Mm -hmm. I understand. So there must be very big for you choice then at the big company. Is that correct? Or? It has been game changing and just having mm -hmm. tools that can, uh, you know, obtain and store a model for you. Um, there are now tools that help uh, do things like hyperparameter tuning, which are amazing. Um, they'll run a whole bunch of experiments for you. You can actually see there's tools that will uh, test, uh, you know, uh, tens of models for you and tell you which one is the best for your particular and all of these tools, the whole process faster. So uh, yes, I'm very appreciative of them and and a lot of tools for, for cloud deployment are also um, very, very useful and very important. And I suppose if uh, you would can report the same. Yeah, maybe one main difference. Again, we're not a company, we're not an AI company. 
right? So artificially, for example, that's their core business. Intel, obviously, of course, also has a stake in there. We're a company that makes use of digitization, including AI, as an enabler, right? It's mm -hmm. not something that is core to what we do. Our core is chemistry. Um, so from that aspect, uh, we have many, many different teams that just sprang up over time in the various parts of the organization. So mm -hmm. be it in marketing and sales and research and PT. Um, and that means we started with, I would say, ground root kind of people, which is good, right? They really came from the problem, but also meant we had a lot of different approaches and also toolings. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're actually just right now busy to getting a company-wide ML DevOps environment um, that actually combines all these groups on the same platform. Mm -hmm. Ops hasn't really been in our focus too much so far. Like I said before, many things are fine as an MVP. They don't have to, they, they're, they're kind of being deployed once or maybe just as a real data science project, just finding out certain things once and that's enough. They don't have to be continued. Mm -hmm. um, but we're getting there. So we're implementing it right now. Okay. So let's uh, dive into uh, the superstar um, at the moment that everyone is talking about, right? Um, are you... Uh, did, did you like the chat GPT announcement, um, Marco, or you hate it for whatever reason? I mean, has this <laughs> changed any of your work? Uh, is now suddenly everyone <clears throat> calling that was before saying, what the heck is that stuff? And no one wants to have a project or business as usual. Um, so what's what's your take on uh, on this? Um, and uh, yeah. No, no, I, I, I like it very much, of course, because uh, also because it works for us. You know, it advertises AI a lot. And now you, you go to the bakery and you can talk about chat GPT. Uh, but the question is that, uh, okay, maybe the technology is not so refined uh, with respect to what we had before, but it definitely had, uh, you know, to pass like a threshold of acceptance because now it, it, uh, mm, its conversation is very good, even for maybe the content is not necessarily so good always, but uh, it works very nicely in a very flexible way. So it's not a revolution in, in a technical sense, but it, it is probably a revolution in the applications that we can have now with ChatGPT. And, uh, and it can change the work uh, a lot, I think, because uh, for instance, compared to what I was saying before, that uh, in a sense, open AI did mind are far away from the, you know, from, from the layman, from the applications that uh, the layman can care about. This is different with respect to ChatGPT because then you can use it really to summarize documents, to, you know, give titles to documents, to talk to you in a nice way. And they use it as an interface to maybe complicated systems of equations or something else. Um, so no, I think that this is extremely useful, especially for NLP applications. It will be great also for us. And mm -hmm. also because you can, you know, you can use it, you can call it. Uh, one thing that is going to be difficult with ChatGPT will be all the applications where privacy of the documents is important. Because if mm -hmm. you have any time to send a request to the US, to open AI, many people will not want to use it, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, Joyce, uh, happy about ChatGPT or um, did it make your life uh, more complicated or, or the, what's, what's your take on this? Uh, a little both, actually, uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, Marco pointed out, you know, the privacy of documents is, yeah, you know, an important thing to, to take into consideration. Um, if you're asking questions that the internet knows the answer to, it's great. Uh, if you have to give it your data in order to get the answer, this is a, this is a challenge. And you know, the, I don't to have uh, our intellectual property uh, accidentally exposed, right? Uh, so there's that balance. I think this is true, though, for any cloud um, type uh, resource that there's that balance. So that's something that uh, we'll have to figure out as part of the AI community, mm. I think, you know, how, how to keep data safe um, or not necessarily safe, but uh, uh, private, mm. um, uh, while it allowing, you know, the benefits of something like chat GPT, which, you know, in terms of interface, wow, this is a fantastic interface model. It's so okay. easy to use. Um, so, you know, in terms of, you know, usability and, uh, you know, um, human factor engineering, uh, it's, this is really um, a leap forward, I think, in, okay. in terms of interface with an model. Right, right. So, Eve, how was it that, uh, at Evonik, are you guys actually opening this up in your company or is it blocked? Because here are some Swiss companies, they block it. Um, of course, uh, the, mainly the banks, insurance companies and so forth, they don't let their people for them 
mentioned recent uh, privacy and uh, they don't want suddenly some stuff being sent over to the US uh, and someone looks at that. Um, um, how is it with Evonik? Um, did you did you guys embrace this or is it more a challenge or you don't care? <laughs> no, uh, we do care. But um, yeah, it, I, I can just mirror again what, what um, the two other colleagues have said. So it is very good in that it really created visibility for the topic of AI, specifically generative AI. So that's, that's certainly very good because people get inspired, right? And that's sometimes difficult mm -hmm. to get. So we got many more calls than we typically got where people said, hey, can we use this for this? Can we use this for this? And that's great. And while OpenAI has done a pretty good job in expectation management and saying, hey guys, please be aware, whatever this says is not necessarily correct, people tend to ignore that part, right? So it, it, I'm a little bit of a party pooper right now in the company that I tell people, great that you call me, but wait, don't use this yet. This is currently not a business tool yet, right? It will come at some point, but we're now looking internally on how we can make that available to the company if it doesn't come anyway, through, of course, our Microsoft products and the Azure mm -hmm. Cloud and so forth. Right. Um, so it's it's kind of yeah trying to 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 get the people to realize that this this will come and it will be bring, bring benefit, but not today. And specifically, like uh, Joyce mentioned, uh, make clear that they should not use their email address from the company, not put company information in there, and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not blocked. At least last time I checked, it wasn't blocked. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, ultimately, the big models behind it, uh, from not surprisingly, the big tech firms uh, in the US here and now um, behind it. So this, this so to train such a model is super expensive. Right? And it's huge uh, compute power and uh, energy we talked about because in the millions, right? Uh, you, I'm sure you, you know the the, uh, the details. Um, I'm just reading these numbers and uh, so. Is, uh, is this something still to be expected uh, to solve real world applications that uh, you are also at artificially looking at the, the big model, uh, um, basically kill, kill any, any project approach, you know, once done, you know, you just <laughs> press the return button is doing the job or is this uh, illusionary and it's just one special case and it doesn't have a direct uh, impact for you guys when you, when you do projects or are you, are you looking into this as well? And you know, I guess then you need to look at also how this can be financed because for a startup uh, to spend a couple million on computers <laughs> is probably not so, so straightforward. I don't know if you are asking me, uh, Rafi, in any case, uh, of course, that is not our business in the sense that uh, it will still be in the hands of those big companies, you know, doing the training of super big models. But uh, on the other end, I don't think it is killing all the others because. Uh, you know, these models eventually, to some extent, are released also to the other guys through APIs and so So you can make queries to the model, maybe paying some sense each query. Um, and then you can also fine tune these models to your application. So I guess that if they didn't do this, if they wouldn't do that, nobody would do that. But since they do that, then we can profit too, in a sense. Um, interestingly, maybe there are also nice uh, public projects in France, for instance, they developed a big language model, just putting together all the university labs, uh, mm -hmm. just in order to, you know, to be competitive with open AI and so forth. So I regard it, that was like a new uh, from maybe six months ago or so. And I think this is a nice move because, you know, also countries should be competitive. You cannot just leave all this power in the hands of the big tech companies. And maybe, you know, just joining all the labs together, we have the same computing power. It can address more or less the same spend and, uh, and, and train very big models that are eventually released also in the code as public mm -hmm. models. Right. Choice is uh, Intel working on the next big model as well. And then you, uh, the next wave uh, Intel is bringing out or how, how is it uh, there? How... I don't know about that. I, I can't speak to that myself. Um, but, uh, you know, I can say, you know, one of the things that that GPT and is pointing out is the need for more uh, optimized solutions and also compute solutions that are more energy efficient that can provide the same um, same results. Mm -hmm. um, I heard um, the Verge reported on a podcast, the Verge Cast, that it was costing three million dollars a day to run Chat GPT. As is a day, okay. um, a day uh, three million USD, and that's a uh, money. Mm. I'm expecting to hear shortly that they're going to uh, start charging. Um, they put it out there free so that 
got excited. Um, I think that worked very, very well. Um, mm -hmm. But I can't, I can't think at that price point that uh, they can keep it open forever. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And Eve, has it uh, changed anything in uh, how you look at uh, such projects? Um, I mean, are you trying to, um, I guess, not uh, build your own uh, big model, but uh, partner with uh, other organizations, uh, non-tech firms, uh, to to maybe um, come up with something that, let's say, the whole uh, chemical industry could use or so? Or is, is this not, not something uh, you are currently busy with? Not really. So we do use NLP, mm -hmm. of course, in many different use cases um, where we use then typically transfer, right? Transfer um, these systems over to our data. Um, we are looking at how that would work also for, um, yeah, the, the different language models that are out there right now. Um, we, there, I mean, there is actually a European initiative. I don't know if, you, if you're aware of this called LEAM. Um, mm -hmm. which is dark, large uh, language models uh, in Europe that is supposed to become open source or become available to everybody once they are done. So there is a counter movement, if you will, in Europe. Um, but no, we're definitely not going to develop something ourselves. I don't mm -hmm. even think we're going to be putting a lot of effort towards building a language model with others. I think for us, it's going to be more how to bring these into our own company how do we do the transfer what use cases can we work on with them um and that's going to be it that's my current right. my current feeling we're a user we're not a, a a developer right right yeah so um yeah i i know eu projects um and not not personally but uh, they don't have the best reputation and they try to build <laughs> once uh, they try mark could know what i'm talking about uh they uh they once tried to uh, come up with uh, a Google search uh, comp competition and invest a couple hundred million. I'm not sure if they actually invested it, but uh, when I heard that, uh, it's clear that they don't understand high tech. Uh, and but um, anyway, we will see what's coming out of that. Uh, but back to our subject. Um, so, any best practices uh, you can share? Um, no one seemed to be uh, really uh, concerned about this 85 percent. I had a feeling it was like, okay, what? That's maybe what it is, um, but um, it doesn't seem to be. Um, it, uh, be concerned or something. Um, is, th is there are there any any tricks that you are, you guys are applying, Marco, to, uh, or you're just smarter than others to to, to succeed more? Um, or um, is there something you can share that to, or is is this whole discussion about this eighty five percent actually um, looking at this uh, from from a wrong no, angle? And, uh, no, I mean I think it's some that is some kind of objective fact. If you you know look at the average for all the other companies that work in AI, but I think we can do much better. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm maybe I'm repeating myself. So we, you know, of course, uh, as an AI company, you have to be able to talk to the clients. And talking to the clients is not necessarily easy because they have a different culture, and the culture maybe is not so AI-ish at the moment. Uh, and so you have to brainstorm and maybe like Joyce was saying in the beginning, you know, you have to brainstorm initially to find out what are the hot topics for them that at the same time are addressable to you with the current technology. And then you have to set up a nice team because uh, as I was saying before, we have had projects in which uh, the project was nice, we were ready, we had, we had the capabilities, but the company was not so involved, even after paying for, you know, the paying us for working with them. Uh, for some reason, mm -hmm. they had no time because they had other projects and this one there. And eventually, you know, the project cannot be successful if there is only one side committed. Also, the company must be committed, not just by paying the money, but also by putting their people that really work with us. So to me, that is the most important thing overall. You know. Right. So uh, ultimately, it must have been a concern for you, Joyce. You wrote a book, right? Small one, mm -hmm. but uh, important points. Uh, so um, anything you want to add? Uh, has, uh, has this book uh, helped uh, the Intel folks to, to get more? Uh, get it. Uh, get these projects uh, with higher percentage uh, to, on the success uh, route, or how do? Uh, I can't. Well, I have an experiment to verify, but I hope so. Um, you know, the the key points that I I put out in the book are, you know, taking the top front, like Mark was saying, you know, to make sure clear uh, understanding of of what it is that you're going to build. Make sure that you have the right people together in the team. Mm. Um, another reason I've seen you know, for projects to not to the finish line is when you have uh, maybe data scientists working on the project, but they don't have that same level of domain expertise. 
And so then you run into situations where, yes, it's a great model, but it tell me what I really wanted to know, or it's, it misses the mark somehow, or it um, uh, puts importance on something that isn't uh, that important to a domain expert. And so then you need to you know, back to the drawing board mm. in, in your pretty far down the path usually at that point. And so that's that can be very, very disappointing to the teams involved um so that's that's another thing i think um mm -hmm. to take into consideration you know the team that you have working on the project is very important right so uh eve how important is uh, bringing uh machine learning experts with domain experts together for you guys i guess that's uh, super important and what, what are some best practices that you have learned over the years so that uh, you you apply in such projects i want to share something please Sure. So I mentioned before that um, this has grown organically in Nipponics. So that means we have these people sitting everywhere. We don't have like one core team where everybody is put together and specifically for the reason Joyce just mentioned, because domain expertise is important. Mm -hmm. So we got engineers with a data science degree. We got scientists, chemists with a, a data science degree and so forth. And they work on their, on their problems. Um, but it also means at the same time, you have to keep them together in terms of learning, in terms of processes, in terms of not doing the same thing over and over again. So we have, again, what I mentioned before, like a front end loading process where we say, if something comes up, you know, first thing, check if it already exists somewhere in a similar fashion. So we have databases and tools for that. Um, if it doesn't, we have a standard way of putting those on paper. Um, then they go into a, a kind of a group of data scientists that are across the company. So they say, yes, uh, this indeed doesn't exist yet. Yes, it's possible. Your best contact partner is this person. And with that person, that would be a make or buy discussion because honestly, we should not be making everything in house. We're getting past that point more and more, right? There's more things that are off the shelf mm -hmm. um, for specific applications and so forth. So we, we really focused a lot on this. Please put in the one, two or weeks up front to really make sure you got the whole company picture and the expert know how and sharpening your issue and your problem before you actually spend any money, right? So that's something that has really, I think, at least helped us. Um, but it's uh, it, it remains a battle, right? Because people tend to to jump on stuff if they're excited, which is great, but it does need a little bit of a process to make sure we don't waste time and money. Right, okay. So we are already coming to the end. Uh, one final minute for everyone. Uh, so a very hard count. Uh, Marco, what uh, you still want to say to wrap it up uh, that you haven't been able to say because I didn't ask for? <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, maybe still on the matter of... Um you know, making projects work. I think that on our side, on the side of data scientists or AI companies, what we need to have also is a certain figure that uh, is a kind of an enabler. He's not necessarily a data science expert, but is uh, able to translate the needs from the company to the data scientists and vice versa. This kind of translation is really important because data scientists can be very clever, but maybe they are not able to grab, you know, to the, the company's needs, the, the, you know, you must be smart for, for this kind of thing. You have to have some business taste also in your mind, uh, understand where the company really can make money, where it is easy to do that from a data science point of view. And so, and, and make the two parts uh, talk to each other in a nice way, you know, in a brainstorming nice way to find ideas and opportunities. So this figure is very important, I think, also. Mm -hmm. Joyce, your last minute comments, please. Yeah, I think it's... Uh... A kind of a caution, right? Um, AI can uh, be very exciting, as we see with GPT. Um, humans have a tendency to think that the other thing, the computer, is also more human, uh, which can be a problem. But it's it's not, um, and so keeping in mind that you know AI are just models that not in the history they have no idea. Uh, they can't come up with ideas on their own. I think those are, are key things to be keeping in mind. And reinforce when you're talking about AI projects uh, to leaders, manager, customers, uh, their engineers. Uh, that's that's important. Right. So if your last uh, words for this panel, please. <laughs> One minute. Sure. So I'll go again for the non-AI native companies because we're one. So for those companies that are just trying how to make use of this, um, I would say don't feel bad if you haven't figured it out yet, right? So I think we're all still learning. This is still an emerging technology. As long as you don't shut down and you treat it 
um, to a certain extent also still as a developmental effort and you accept a certain number of failures, you get there in the end, right? So, um, but, and that's important, um, make sure you have the right internal and external ecosystem in place. Don't just try to figure out everything by yourself. Um, you will not be able to be, to be in time and catch up to everything that's going on. All right. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Marco. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks, Eve, for your time and uh, input here. And all the best and uh, uh, lots of uh, very successful in operation <laughs> AI projects for everyone. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.